So this is lecture 19 of ECE 53.312. And so in today's lecture, what we're going to look at is we're going to continue our analysis, our study of performance bounds, performance bounds, not exact solutions, for uh, digital communication transmitters and receivers operating in additive white Gaussian noise channels. So what we're going to do is like last class, and we'll revisit that, what we explored there was sort of like the sort of strict and the loose, the weak upper bounds on performance, pr probability of error performance. It's like almost like, like, uh, like uh, for instance, like, like what is the absolute like worst performance we can get with this system, right? Because suppose you want to choose a communication system, and it says, I cannot afford any communication system that gives me more than, let's say, 10 to the minus 5 performance. Then you establish upper bounds. You choose a bunch of designs. Let's say all of you design a system. And then I calculate upper bound, and I say, uh, yeah, Ryan's might work. Uh, Mosafis might work. Oh, no, sorry, Bangi. But your upper bound potentially exceeds what my specs are and stuff, right? So what happens is um, upper bounds are sort of quick dirty, easy ways of analyzing the performance of a system, especially if we have a constraint. There are also lower bounds. And, and you might wonder, so what? Why do I care about lower bound? I want better BR. I want that BR to be zero if possible. But let's say it's not. So there are techniques, which we will look at now, where we kind of analyze sort of the lower bound on performance. And so let's, let's actually recap what we did last class. Oh, because you know why I want to recap, because I just want to play with this pen, right? <laughs> okay. So, so what essentially happens is, remember from last class, we have this beautiful generic expression for uh, a, a, a essentially any sort of uh, binary modulation scheme. Q, right? Q function, square root d min squared divided by 2 and not. And that is a very powerful expression itself, right? Because as we saw, if we have a signal constellation, right? And we have that guy. And let's say we had this guy. This was actually from the homework assignment. And so let's say this is a phase modulation. So there, both these guys are away from the origin. We know that that's going to have a radius of square root of ES and a square root of ES, correct? Right? What happens is we're actually concerned about the minimum Euclidean distance between these two guys. Because as we saw, suppose we have noise. And the noise is going to be concentrated essentially around these guys. But there is the possibility that the noise might accidentally go across the obvious decision region, a halfway point between these two signal constellation points, right? So what we want to do is this expression here tells us what the probability of error would be in this scenario. We would need to find a d min squared. And so that's actually kind of easy, because we know that this guy is a right angle. So let's say we zoom in. So the square root of es squared, uh, sorry, of es, the square root of es we need to find a hypotenuse. What is that guy going to be equal to? The square root of ES plus ES, which is equal to the square root of 2ES. And we saw that then we plug that in. The probability of error will be Q of the square root of 2ES divided by 2 and naught. And well, you guys see what happens. Get rid of the 2. They cancel out. And that's your performance bound, right? And then. Oh, and then what happens is we looked at the case. Okay, so let's let's actually delete all this. We looked at the case of pairwise error probabilities. So this squiggle here, right? This squiggle here signifies what is the pairwise error probability. Ooh, it's not I. Assume it's one, that dot is just bad. There. That's legit. Almost. So this guy here is my pairwise error probability. Error prob. And what the pairwise error probability signifies is essentially I transmit S1, but decode 
sj. So essentially what happens is here's my s1 vector, here's sj somewhere in space, and then what happens is essentially we saw this last class. We have the line, right, between these two guys, and that's the halfway mark, and the noise vector, let's say, is like that. When we project this down onto this, this line that connects the heads of S1 and SJ, exceeds the halfway mark, and therefore what that means is we will decode. It is closer, this resulting vector. Oh, come on. See, this guy here, that's what we receive. R, R will decode as being closer to SJ than to S1, and that's an error. So what we do, remember what we looked at. We looked at essentially the scenario where all we care about is if we get into one error, we count it as an error. We don't, like the funny thing is, in the formulation that we looked at last class, I don't care how many error events occur. I just, it's really just a flag, right? Error, right? And what do I mean by that? What is the probability, okay, capital P, that this guy here is an error, or this guy, oh, sorry, so let's do S2. Oh, this is so sloppy. That's why I have an electronic eraser. One, two, one, three, one, four, two, 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 two. 1n. What this means is that, do I have an error between 1 and n? S1 and Sn. Yes or no? Let's say no. Well, it doesn't matter. We have to check every possible pairwise error combination. Because if you look at this, like, sure, we obviously have an error between S1 and Sj. But suppose I also have, you know, here is S2. Do I have an error? No because R will not decode. It will decode more readily to S1 or SJ than it would to S2. S2 is too far away, right? But, ha, 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 what happens if S3 is there? Mm -hmm. What happens is, in this game, S3 is closer to R than S1. SJ is closer to R than S1. We have two cases, at least, and maybe more, where we have pairwise error probabilities that are in the positive, the affirmative. It doesn't matter. All I care about is, is it? it. And if it's like really bad, terrible error, doesn't matter. It's still an error. That's all I care about. Okay? So we looked at this formulation. And this formulation, uh, this is like fundamental probability stuff, right? So the novice. The novice would say, so let's take this guy. First of all, I'm going to erase this stuff. So the novice would say, well, that's going to be equal to the probability of the first pairwise error probability plus the probability of the second pairwise error probability plus the probability of the third errorwise probability or what uh, error event, sorry. So on, all the way to the probability of this guy, right? But that's not totally correct. And why is that? Let's go to looking at the sample space. So let's erase this guy. So let's say we go to our lima bean sample space omega, right? And we have little events in here, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. Let's create sets in the sample space. And then, of course, I'm going to choose a different color. And suppose I label this. This guy here is A, B, C, D. Now, we saw in probability, what happens if you have P, A, union B, union C. This should split up pretty nicely, right? P, A, plus P, B, plus P, 
C. That's fine. Why? None of the sets overlap, right? So if you take the probability measure and you look at these sets, you get this. Now, but now, let's get rid of that guy. <laughs> and we do union D. <gasps> now, this is not legit. Just to hold it at just the sum of the individual, the probability measure of the individual sets. Why? Because we're double counting. We're double counting, folks. We're double counting this region here. What I'm doing in green. What's happening, essentially, is we're taking whatever mass or whatever amount or whatever the, the, that area that overlaps between uh, set B, D and B, we're double counting it, right? <clears throat> Classic mistake. So as a result, the safe thing to do is to subtract one of the double copy parts, right? So what you do is you say, boop. I'm going to remove one of those intersections, and I'm all set, right? Now, we go back to this guy here, all these error probabilities, right? These, uh, not error probabilities, these error events. And if we go through the same approach, we too must also consider any sort of intersection, any sort of dependency between these error events, because of whatever reason, like for instance, if like, you know, if we have several signal constellation points, like, you know, all we care about is does R, which is nudged by the noise, is it closer to one point um, other than, let's say, S1 in this case? And what happens is, the problem is, is like, let's say it gets displaced. It might not only set off bells and whistles at one other signal vector, it might be several in this direction. Let's say I take R, like the example, it was close to SJ and S3, right? Oh, okay. So now, how do we separate the two out? Which one is it, really? Which one will get coded, right? So what happens is, just alone, this guy here is not sufficient. We have to also subtract all the intersections and such. And then we saw that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Oh, okay, yeah. Let's use the big eraser, which is what we saw last class is the probability of error. We can say this guy here uh, I'm trying to think. Okay, did you do, 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 do. Yep, sorry. Made a boo boo. It's going to be less than or equal to the sum oh. is equal to the sum. Let's say j goes from 2 to n. The probability of the error event, the pairwise error event, 1. J. And then we saw that this guy, in turn, with that simple pairwise calculation, is nothing more than Q square root D 1 J squared divided by 2 N naught. Beautiful. And then we saw this one step further. What we can do with something like this is Maybe we just pick the most significant guy. Who will give us the most significant guy? Whichever one has the smallest argument going into the Q function. And then we multiply it by n minus 1. So this, in turn, shh, 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 shh. I can hear you guys. <laughs> this, in turn, I can still hear you guys. So what happens is, is d min squared to n naught. What happens is, this is an even weaker bound on the upper bound. Basically, I said, let's just take the weak, let's take this guy. He'll yield the biggest, most significant contribution to the pairwise error probabilities and multiply him by n minus 1 times. Loose upper bound, a little bit more strict upper bound on the probability of error of your system. Okay. Now, what we're going to look at afterwards, we're going to take 
like later in this lecture, we're going to look at an oddball case. We're going to look at we're going to look at a case where we have n orthogonal signals. And when we have n orthogonal signals, this actually helps us a lot. We can actually we can come up with the exact probability of error. And as you'll see, this is like almost like like going for dental treatment. <laughs> yeah, I don't like I like I don't like going to the dentist either. Okay, so we saw lower bound, upper bound. Almost the same thing. Almost the same thing. Actually, let's go back to the slides. So, the upper bound. Right now, let's say we do something like this. So, first of all, we have a probability of error. And at the very least, it will be greater than or equal to the Q function of a single pairing of i and j, neither of which are equal to each other, squared divided by 2 and naught. So this is a pairwise error probability between two signals and their distance. And we're saying the probability of error should be equal to, of the, the probability of error of the entire system should be either equal to or greater than, because we're only looking at one schmo. We're only looking at one probability of error out of maybe a gajillion pairwise error probabilities, right? And we're picking one. Right? There is a possibility it might be equal, but at the very least, we know that, you know, in essence, there might be other non-negligible pairwise error probabilities, and th so this number should actually be bigger, but we want to know what the lower bound is. Right? So, yep. Minus I'm getting there. So the question is, can we use d min squared? That, 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 would, that would essentially establish the absolute lower bound. And then, but that's going to be a very... Like, that would be a weak bound. We actually want to get uh, like, you know, as close as possible. So we'll, we'll build upon that. You're, you're taking lightning out of my thunder. So it's like, OK. No, no, very good, very good. Because what happens is, let's, let's like, that's, that's what, you know, you kind of read ahead. <clears throat> what happens is, getting, getting to that, that would give you the best lower bound. Why? Because this would be the largest. Like, as I said during office hours today, what's a shortcut? in calculating probability error. So let's say your boss says, OK, uh, meeting in 10 minutes. And where's that derivation, Jimmy, of um, the probability of error performance for this communication system? And you're like, oh, totally forgot. You know, and this is like my worst nightmare. I wake, I wake up sometimes once in a while. Don't you have those nightmares that you, 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 you go to school and you realize you had an exam and you forgot about it and you come late and it's already done? I'm not sure how many people have that. But I think it's usually with people like, who are like, like, you know, very meticulous and precise and stuff. And it's like, oh my god, my wife has it all the time. Okay? But what happens is, suppose, like, 10 minutes, you have a meeting with Professor Roglinski about your course design project, and he's really expecting a probability of error performance calculation. And you say, okay, okay, okay. So what you do, so let's go back to this guy. Right? What you would do is something like this. Like, you know, you would have, first of all, your modulation scheme, right? Let's do that instead. Maybe you have other modulation schemes as well. So, and then another one. So that's one PSK, that's another PSK, and that's another PSK. Right? That's very sloppy. And what happens is, you know, um, in essence, whenever we calculate a probability of error, suppose I, 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 I assume some sort of bound or some sort of approximation where I have, let's say, one guy p12 squared over 2 n naught. And then let's say I have p13 squared over 2 n naught. And then let's say I have another one, p. But let's say I keep on doing this. And let's say, <laughs> let's, let's get rid of the example on the side here. Let's get something really awful. Suppose you have a modulation scheme that has 256 signal constellation points. I want you to calculate the pairwise error probability of, let's say, with point S1 with all other 255. And you're saying, I got 10 minutes? You will be racing. Your hands are going to be so sweaty that your pen can't be held by them. What do you do? Who has the worst one? Who has the closest one? that basically sets it an order of magnitude higher than everyone else. Because imagine, in the end, you do the calculation. Let's say you find the worst possible, you find the weakest link. 
And the weakest link says 10 to the minus 3. And then let's say everyone else is 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9. Think about this. This is four orders of magnitude bigger than the next largest guy. What do you do? Ignore. Right? And you keep this guy. So what Mustafa said, Wumble Gee Min, that's what you're looking for. If you want fing dirty. Because then you come to me and say, and you say, oh, Professor, off times. Do, do, the, do the drama. So, first of all, I didn't have sleep. I really need coffee. No, just kidding. I believe you guys when you come into my office and say that. But what happens is you come into my office, oh, I slaved over this, and this is what I got. And I look at it and say, oh, that's really ingenious. So you ignored all the insignificant terms, and you got this very nice answer. And I say, that's a great job and stuff, and kudos to you. And, and you only spent 10 minutes. But, but seriously, shortcuts like this are legit. And that's what comes down to this guy on this slide. D min squared, right? This will establish the lower bound performance. But is it, how good a lower bound is it? In this case, it's the best one. What happens is we go through the optimization. You find all the matching. So you have to do this by eye. You have your signal constellation diagram. Maybe you draw it to scale. And you look for all the pairings. And then, yeah, this one's going to be the closest one. That is going to be the scary one. Intuitively, what does that mean? Noise. The closest guy is the most likely to create error. There might be the guy behind him that might also, if you had a gross amount of error, it might even skip the nearest one and go to the next guy. It does not matter. All we care about is flag, there's an error. Right? The closest guy is going to be that error. Aha! Okay. So, Skipping ahead, not skipping ahead. Let's do a summary. Because this stuff, like you might think, OK, why are we talking about this? Well, it's really cool. Because what happens is we've got upper bound and lower bound. And so where do you use stuff like this? Well, you probably see it in your textbooks. And you know, it would be really cool for your projects, even later in, in life. Let's say you guys are like, I derive this performance of this communication system, I made a few assumptions, and then let's test it out with the upper and lower bound and see if it fits in between. It's your sanity check, right? Just like Shannon's capacity limit is the sanity check. Oh, it exceeded Shannon's capacity. Congratulations, you got a Nobel Prize. Get out of my office, right? It's like, you know, the <laughs> Oh, you know, the, you know, that's the thing. Reviewers can be vicious. Whenever you submit a journal paper and, oh, let's calculate the channel capacity, you know, take the slide ruler, oh, oh they exceeded it. Mm, reject, right? And all you have to do is say, exceed Shannon capacity, and your paper is in, like, you know, in the pile, file nine. So what this guy does is essentially he establishes the upper and lower bounds for whatever exact expression for your probability of error is. It should fit snugly in there. There's a reason why it's called a bound. It's not going to go outside of that, right? Just like out of bounds. Like, you know, like if you're playing dodgeball, which, whew, I'm not sure how many people here play dodgeball, but, you know, there are bounds. You cannot leave the bounds of the dodgeball uh, court. Otherwise, you know, you're out, and then you're on the side of the room. So here, what happens is we use this as a tool. The bounds tell us if we do come up with an exact expression, or one, an exact expression with a lot of assumptions in order to make the math tractable, this will tell us if we're on the right track. Because if we go out of bounds, we're disqualified. And so there is a weaker bound. I talked about this, right? You find the d min, and you multiply by all the pairings. This would give you kind of a loosey-goosey upper bound. And that's still, that's still good. Uh, the other one is if you've got time. If you, got, if you say, well, I've got time to kill. Oh, I'm so envious of you guys. If any of you have like, oh, two hours to kill, I will like, give me those two hours. But what would happen is, if you don't have time to calculate 255 error probabilities piecemeal, then this is the sort of sloppy way of getting out. Because we already got this guy, right? Take this guy multiplying by n minus 1. Boom, you're done. We're not, okay, we're not talking about 10 minutes. We're talking about two minutes of calculation. And how does this look like? Oh, this looks like awesome. Look at this guy. This is what I mean, folks. 
This is what I mean. You got your upper bound on your probability of error waterfall curve. You got your lower bound. And what happens is, think of it, Q function, that guy dies quickly. He goes down and is, becomes asymptotic. So what should happen ultimately, if your bounds are calculated nicely, is whatever exact exp expression for probability of error with assumptions that you've derived, it should follow in somewhere in that dotted line, in between the two bounds. And then you know you're good, right? Simulations, that's a different thing altogether. So this works for theoretical stuff. But it ain't so good for the simulations. Why? How many times are you running those simulations? How many times are you averaging? What are the error bars? Now, here's, here's an interesting thing. What you could do if you do simulations is you also see how many standard deviations. Like, let's say like you plot the mean of all your experiments, and you also superimpose on your plot for every simulation point of your BER curve you put an error bar. Not an error bar, but like the standard deviation. And why? I'll show you. Huh. I'm going to give you some practical advice. Because this stuff is golden. I got burned many, many, many moons ago when I was an undergrad student. And what happens is I did simulation runs. And people say, oh, this looks so smooth. This looks great. This is wonderful performance. It almost exceeds Shannon capacity. But what happens is they said, how many times did you run the simulation? And I was like an undergrad. I was like, thinking, uh, 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 two times? Mm, not the right answer. This is, what, this is what you're supposed to do. Like, you know, if you're really, you know, in some nice classic papers and digital comms do, does this. So what happens is, suppose you're running your computer simulation. So first of all, there's a book by Shamugan. Shamugan. Nice baby blue book. Um, Jeruchim. I forgot person three. Beautiful book, though. It's on communication systems engineering simulation. And, the, and it tells you sort of like, you know, how do you accurately model a communication system in software and run experiments and, you know, it being credible. So one thing is this. Okay. So let's say that's your theoretical. And way too many times I've seen students of mine come and say, oh, here's my simulation of my communication system, and it looks like this. You know? And I say, ah, that's awful. That's like, no, that's not acceptable. So first of all, what does this tell me? First of all, what are we looking at here? So this is more like practical advice time, folks, not necessarily. So what this tells me is I have worse error performance for higher SNR, so why don't you just like, use less SNR and get more performance, right? So it should, your curve should be monotonic. Like, like you know, for AWGN channel, intuitively, what you should have is, you saw it, right, the Q functions. What you should have is what they call, oh, what they call the waterfall curves because it looks like a waterfall. Remember that this guy here is log scale, like dB, and this guy's in log scale. So hence you get the nice smooth curves. And what happens is if you have interference, what this guy will become, this will be called the SINR. And what you get in those cases is something that looks like this, where the noise is dominant at the you know, lower signal, -noise ratio, signal to noise and interference ratios. But then you get this weird plateau area, and that's your interference floor, right? So you have this thing called the interference floor, int floor. Now, going back to my simulation uh, conversation, suppose you do um, a simulation run. Okay, what happens is, let's say that's a point, 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 that's a point. I think there was even an um, an additional problem in one of your homework assignments that talk about like running simulations and run BER curves. What you want to do, you know, if you really want to intimidate the reviewer or whatever, or me, if you give me these results, is these are the mean, right? The mean of the probability of error at those SNR values. The mean, right? What you want to do also 
And this can be accomplished using a function called error bars, or you can draw these yourself if you are savvy with graphical tools in, in MATLAB. What these guys are, that's your standard deviation up and standard deviation down. And what this tells me is, did you run a sufficient number of experiments and average them out? When you have error bars, let's put an example here. If you have an error bar that looks like this, what this it should be symmetric, but when you have an error bar like that, it means any, anywhere, it's, that's within a standard deviation, that point can be. It's like, basically tells me you haven't averaged enough, right? So Sh Shamigan and others, what they, they came up with a very interesting rule of thumb. If you read through it, basically the rule that you have for an uncoded system, coding is different, coding screws up everything. But an uncoded system, a digital communication system, if you want, I forgot, is it 95 or 90 percent confidence you need to have for transmission. So let's say you run your simulation and you're trying to calculate a probability of error for each one of these points. You need to have 100 errors. So you keep on transmitting bits, 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 bits until you get 100 errors and then you're 90, 95 percent confident. I think uh, Shamigan comes up with the derivation where that comes from, right? What happens is 100 errors, no problem for very low, very low signal to noise ratio. Like down here, that comes like boom, errors, you're done. Well, but 10 to the minus 9. If you don't have a fast computer, oh, memory filled, please start again, right? But what happens is really like, um, that's for uncoded systems, and I have to figure out what the confidence is. But what these little intervals tell me, why is this so critical? Because let's say you're duking it out. One, let's, say, let's say we take um, Ree's algorithm, and let's say we take Travis's algorithm, who has a better error performance. So we put them side by side, and let's say we have something like this. And then we put their standard deviations to me, this looks pretty bad. Not in the sense that one is better than the other, but more like they're both within a standard deviation of each other. So it's still potentially fluky that sometimes you're going to have the other guy perform better than others. Like, you know, you might look at the mean, but they're, they're statistically kind of in like a dead heat. They're very close together. They have overlapping error bars. Like, you know, sure, if you do things like turbo codes and you talk about Point 0.1 dB off. Wow, that's fantastic! Like you know, but but in error performance land, what happens is like you really need to run your simulations. If you can get really tight error bars and say this is exactly like you know, let's say Re and Travis re-simulate or continue to simulate, what you get? Oh darn! I really should do a better job there of cleaning myself up there. What happens is, let's say now we have this. And we do the same thing with the error bars, but now you really run the simulations. You get like a thousand errors, right? You stop after a thousand errors. And your standard deviations, your confidence intervals, these guys are so tight, there's no overlap. Then proof positive, green is doing better than blue, right? So that's, so that's where, like, you know, if you, if you, um, you go into the, the sort of like this idea of running simulations, you have to run a lot of simulations. Because the problem is in the community, you run it once and you get spectacular results. Can you replicate it? Can you do it 100 times, 1,000 times? What's the average behavior we need to characterize, right? Okay. So that, uh, that's my rant. But it really comes out partly because of this curve here with the, you have, let's say, this is the theoretical side of things. And if you run your ex simulation experiments a lot where your confidence intervals and the means fit snugly between lower and upper bound, that's pretty darn good. And, that, and you know, if you don't have access to communications hardware, what you normally do is you have your theoretical derivation and then you support it with your computer simulation, right? All right. Okay, so now I'm off of that horse. I'm going to jump onto this horse, which is close.
expression, closed form expression for probability of error. And you might say, what, am I, what do I mean by closed? And what I mean by closed is that my probability of error is represented by, at most, one integral expression. Can we do that? Well, let's see. Okay. So, what, so one numerical integration. So what we're going to do, we're not going to take PSK or, uh, yeah, we're not going to take a PSK or a QAM or a PAM modulation because that already gets very tedious. What we're going to do is we're going to find the closed form probability of error expression for an m -ary orthogonal signal, which has more than two signal constellation points. So what do I mean by that? So orthogonality, remember what that means. We take two signals, any two signals, we match them up. If they're not the same one, we take the correlation of them. They should be equal to zippo, zero. Otherwise, they should correlate strongly if they're the same, right? Yay! Okay. So what happens is the following. So let's say all the orthogonal signals are of equal energy. So what's the easiest one? When we have cosines operating at different frequencies. Easy, right? Because in the frequency domain, how do they look like? They're separated, right? They're totally not overlapping. At least in the space, time, frequency, you know, the electrospace, one of those dimensions, they look clearly separated, and I can work on them. They're orthogonal. Right? So what, that's one great example. So let's say we have a family of cosines at different frequencies. So this is kind of like frequency shift keying, right? If it's one signal, it's one frequency. If it's another signal, it's another frequency. So essentially, amplitude, the same. Phase, the same. Different frequency. So depending on during which symbol period, which frequency is active tells me which binary And because they're on different frequencies, they're orthogonal. So the waveform representation is A, cosine. I left out the phase because it does not matter. And 2 pi f i of t. So if you do the correlation, you'll find out that that is beautiful. right? When i and j are not equal, what we find okay, is the following. What we have, essentially, is if we do the correlation of these two guys, so we use trig identities, e. so we have cos A and cos B, what do you get? Well, you get a bunch of double frequency terms and stuff, but at the end of the day, what you're going to get after doing this correlation, all right, is you're going to get a sync pulse. And I don't mean sync as in kitchen sink, it's sync as in S-I-N-C. And what the sync pulse looks like is on the left, one, oh, this is so great. So you get a, a, like, you know, your peak at zero, at the center of the sync pulse. And then you have periodic zero crossings afterwards. And this is great because what happens is, suppose you overlap this guy with another sync pulse, but he's shifted by one. He's going to have zero crossings matching to all your zero crossings. And where there's a zero crossing for every other sync pulse underneath him, he is a peak. So as long as you sample at the right instant, you're fine. So suppose we have the sync pulse, right? Sync x, and that's the form. That's the representation of it. This, at least in this case, that's the definition. Suppose we have the at a magnitude squared, because all I care about is the relative frequency difference. I don't care about the absolute. What we find out is that this is equal to 0. Why? Plug it in. Plug that guy in. And what you'll find out is if, let's say, your frequencies are spaced out strategically, n divided by 2 pi, what happens? So put n divided by 2 pi, sorry, not 2 pi, two, uh, n divided by 2t. So you know what the period is, right? And so n divided by 2t, you plug that into the sink x. And what you'll find is that unless you know, uh, th that i and j are equal, that's going to set that guy to 0, right? Because what you're doing is you're essentially hitting 
the zero crossings. So what ends up happening is, um, in this case, like you, you, what, when we calculate it this way, we actually get a sync pulse. And so what happens is, as we'll see later, we can actually calculate what the exact probability of error expression is. But let's, 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 let's take this back a step. Okay? So first of all, let's look at the coherent case. And what coherent means is that phase is important, the amplitude is important, the frequency. Basically, we need to have like we need to have good timing information, nothing's out of phase, so that we can recover the signal, correlate it, and find out the information. We'll find out that there's a non-coherent case where we use a square law device because we don't care about the phase. We use only the energy of, let's say, whatever incoming signal in order to determine um, whether it's actually one symbol or another, right? The optimal detector in the non-coherent So. The first thing I do is I come up with a decision, a decision variable, zi. Oh, sorry. People told me that I should be pointing to the screen. So, so, so let's say we have this construct for the orthogonal, and this is one example. Okay, but let's let's keep things generic for now. So zi is when we have the received signal, we're projecting it onto SI, what I'm doing essentially, and then integrating over the period, what I'm trying to do is it, how much of R is correlated with SI. And what we find, give us ZI. And just like before, we have brackets. So we take R, so let's go to here. So we go. what we do is we essentially say, okay, here is R of t, okay? Then we multiply it by S1 of t, S2 of t, S3 of t, and so on, right? And then what we do is we integrate. And that produces z1, z2, z3. And you know where I'm going with all of this, right? Now, we take that guy. That, in fact, we transmit it sj, OK? So suppose we have this formulation. What we then do is we now derive the zi's based on the fact that we have uh, s1 plus n um, that's received. And what we get is this stuff here. And you know where this is heading, right? We're going to have, of course, we're going to we're going to get a noise variable where we're trying to correlate the noise with the s. Um, which one is it? On the other hand, we also got the noise, which is, in this part of the course, AWGN. And it's multiplied against an SI, which is a deterministic waveform, and then summed. It is Gaussian. And you know where this is going to head. We have to find out what is the mean and what is the variance of that NI, right? So what happens is that, this, that statistic, that variable, that zi, z1, z2, z3, z4. So z1, we anticipate e, because s1, correlated with s1, will give you the energy plus n1. Everyone else, if they're orthogonal, should only be in a noise. OK, capiche. That's good. So what happens in this event is when zi, one of these zi's is bigger than z1. And the correct event is when z1 is bigger or equal to any other zi. Right? This guy here. This guy here. So now what we need to do is compute what the heck are the statistics of ni. Ah, okay. So what happens is we go through the same math. 
We know, based on previous classes, that whenever we have a deterministic waveform, a Gaussian signal, then we integrate over a period, we get essentially a Gaussian random variable, Ni. It is going to have, just as before, what happens is, let's say we have Ni and Nj. When we take those two guys and correlate them, or not correlate them, we take, we take well, actually, we are correlating them. We take Ni, Nj, take the expected value of them, should be equal to 0. Why? Ni is equal to the integral of nt, si, t, dt. And the other guy is j. They're, they're orthogonal, right? So what happens is just because of how the two waveforms are orthogonal and also the, you know, AWGN, added to white Gaussian noise, so it's uncorrelated, means un independent samples and stuff. What ends up happening is we get zero, if, and that's an exercise for a student. Right, and that's what we have there. So, what happens is when we try and find out the joint Except for one, the Z1 will have the energy plus a Gaussian random variable. Every other one will be Gaussian only, no bias by Z. And what will happen is your joint PDF because Ni and Nj are uncorrelated, is we're going to have essentially the product of the one-dimensional PDFs of these guys. So if we say, let's say, what is the probability of correct reception given that we have Z1? What happens is, and then what we do is we go through the math. So what happens is, we want to find out what's the probability of correct reception. What we do is we average across for all possible Z1 combinations. So we find out what the PDF of Z1 is and multiply it by the conditional PDF and integrate from minus infinity to infinity. That means we're averaging across all possible Z1 values. So, but, so why are we doing this? We're building up to this guy here. This is our error situation, right? So what happens is no, 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 no. That's not our error situation. No. What happens is, so what's this guy here? The probability that Z1 is less than Zi. We're, we're, we want Zi, Z1 to be big, right? So this guy is still correct. Whew. That's what happens when you teach at night. <laughs> Your brain is telling you other things. So what happens is you go through all this wonderful We, again, we've done that before. And so if you go through the mathematics, 1 minus, this, this is the complement. This is what happens when we have the probability that Zi is greater than or equal to Z1, right? That's the bad thing. We know the pairwise error probability, right? And we get, say, how the heck did we get this guy? Who's Gaussian? Right? So what happens is, this is a case where what we have, assume Z1 is deterministic. This is sort of my setup. What happens is, theoretically, both of them are Gaussian random variables, right? Z1, Zi. So what we need to do is we need to condition. We say, oh, yeah, 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 Z1, that's totally known. We know what Z1 is exactly. But do we? So what ends up happening is we essentially, um, Look at this guy and say, let's, let's hold Z1 for now. We're going to average him out after, right? And so what we do is we say, well, I know that this is the probability of error. And 1 minus that will give me the probability of correct reception. And we know that this guy, this is your classic probability scenario. What do I mean? Let's just recap. Where did I get that from? Actually, what is that? Fill color. How do you do that? OK, I'm just experimenting. Sorry, folks. I'm just like, can I put fill color too? This would be like the best toy ever. OK, so remember, 
whenever we have like a Gaussian random variable, so let's say that's your Gaussian, RV, and this guy, this is your deterministic dummy variable. I know, makes him feel bad, right? So what is this equal to? This is going to be equal to, so, so it's essentially, uh, what is the probability that z will produce a value, a random variable, that is greater than or equal to some deterministic constant? So essentially, let's draw your Gaussian bell curve here. So suppose little z is there. What that means is the area under the curve, that's the probability we're trying to calculate. So we do from z to plus infinity, the PDF of z, little z, dz, and this guy here is a Gaussian. So we know that that's going to be 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma e to the minus. Um, we have to assume, like, you know, first of all, is it z minus mu z, that's the mean of z squared, divided by 2 sigma squared, right? So this guy is my Gaussian PDF. Right? And this is the expression for finding the pro this probability. We go back to the slides. We go back to the slides, and we've got, like, we're assuming that zi is the random thing, and we're holding z1 fixed, even though z1 theoretically is also random, right? So we, this guy right away gives us a q function, q function form. So now what happens is we're actually really interested we're really interested. So we do this, we, we again do the sort of pairwise decision making, right? But now what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out what is the probability. So the I event that we're interested in, what is the probability that z2 is greater than or equal to z1 and z3 is greater than z1 and z4 is greater than z1. And what we're trying to do is, sure, we're kind of comparing these different variables with each other, but it, there's an and instead of an or. What I'm looking for, essentially, is what is the probability? Like, so why am I saying this? So what happens is, what is, so what is the probability? Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. Bad, 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 bad. Less than. So the probability of correct reception is when z2, sorry, is less than, not greater than, is less than z1, and z3 is less than z1, and z4 is less than z1. What am I saying? I basically, I'm saying all of these variables, all of them are less than z1. They have to be. What is the probability that that happens? So that's an and condition, not an or condition. And one minus that gives me the probability of error, right? So I have the probability of correct reception, and now let's put on the pessimist hat. Probability of error is when I don't have that. Yes? So the only difference in this case is the error event is also discussed. Great question. So the question is, the, the different in this case, well, it depends. Um, because we're dealing with AWGN, right, that means the noise, the NT, is uncorrelated. And therefore, if you do the calculations and you find out what the statistics are for NI with each other, they're uncorrelated, which in Gaussian terms means they're also independent, which means that, because here's, here's the thing. This is another 502. This is an excellent question. Ha, ha, ha. I can't see. <laughs> what happens is this. Check this out. What happens is, remember the probability, if let's say I have A union B union C union, you know, all the way to Z, right? This is not equal to just probability of A plus probability of B plus, prob you know, so on and so forth, right? There's, there's this intersection business and yada, yada, yada. What a lot of people try and do, so this is one of those basic problems from graduate level probability that I sometimes teach, is we try and get this guy into a form where we can have, let's say, something like A intersect B intersect C intersect, right? Because what happens is if these guys are independent, 
it now becomes a product of all these guys, right? So we can split this up into P A, P B, P C, all the way to P Z, correct? Right? So what happens is um, the top one is not necessarily correct. That's sort of the, the, the trick. Um, people don't know that you also have to take, if there's any overlapping sec, um, sub sets, that you have to subtract them off, otherwise you're double counting them. But when you intersect, then what you can do, especially if they're independent, is they just break up very nicely into these segments, like what we have here. So this guy here, because the noise is independent, you have to, we, had, we have to show that. This guy breaks down. And what you get at the end, okay, is like, you know, you get, so you take this uh, infinite intersection, and this actually breaks down, uh, shouldn't be n minus 1. That, so, but, but essentially what happens is this guy will, will, will essentially, why am I doing that? To the n minus 1 power. That's. Hmm? Two to m here. Yeah, no, but I'm just looking at this. I think this we're going to have to look at after class. But um, what will happen is here, uh, this is making the assumption that um, you know you have the probability of like it doesn't make sense. This should be on the outside. So, and so yeah, otherwise this. Means so what happens is you have a zi, any zi less, what is the probability of zi being less than z1, that probability, to the m minus 1 power? Yeah. Okay, good. Note to self. Okay. So, um, so this is, so lecture 19, what we've just done is we started on this path where just like many times before us, we've got to calculate this new manipulation of noise. So whenever you deal with noise in a system, we always have to be worried about how to take that noise and find the new statistics of it. And essentially what we want to do is go through the structure of here's the probability of correct reception. And it's an and condition. And it's, it's strict. We cannot have any error whatsoever, right? And what we're trying to do is from that, and assuming that it's AWGN, which means it's uncorrelated, which means that it's independent, that if we create any statistics based on that, that it basically trickles down into this form. And in the next lecture, lecture 20, what we're going to do is we're going to try and find a closed form for it. All right? So that concludes lecture 19. OK. So while this thing is, like, that's almost one hour of lecturing. So what we're going to